we're all artists just by the fact that we're human beings. We are creators and we are creating our life every single day, co-creating our life. The more consciousness we can bring to that in integration between these various levels of our being, the above and below, conscious and unconscious, the more agency we have in that creative process, the more control we have over the results that we experience. We can work creatively with what we have, whether that's just how we structure our day and the things that we adorn ourselves with or the foods that we decide to prepare or whatever it is that we're doing with our lives, we can be creative in the way that we do it. Hey there, sinners. It's Adam Knox, and welcome to another episode of The Cult of You, and another interview with the devil. My devil today is the beautiful Marlena Seven Bremner. Marlena, author of this beautifully designed book, and you will notice some of her own artwork on it, is both an author as well as an oil painter and surrealist, and an individual with a very fascinating story and journey. And I have to admit that Marlena has actually become one of my required or recommended reading, even in my own private training series in the Demontership. And if you're interested in training and working with me, you can find our primary link below where you can get more information on that program. I had to talk to Marlena. Seven is one of the most interesting people, especially because of her approach to the occult arts, was something of an unexpected turn of events. A journey through DMT really put her in touch with the chaos structure of the Source Sphere. Stepping away from that journey put her very closely on the Veil of Paraketh, where she would regularly drop down and found art as a medium through which she could relate with the active imaginational communication of the unconscious and the collective that stood beneath that. This journey opened her up to hermetic pursuit that allowed her to understand and really go deep into the hermetic sciences, not only of Hermes, but all the related developments inside of it. And one of my favorite things is this incredible work of hers that explores the planets in such profound depth. Her understanding of the archetypal models and how they operate in ourselves and the depth of those journeys and what this means to us, as well as the utilization of art as an expression of the inner world in a tool of magic is unlike any other. I'm confident that you are going to find thousands of delicious gems and wonderful treats to chew on in today's discussion. So without any further ado, make sure you've checked the book review and enjoy today's conversation and remember to live deliciously. Seven, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on The Cult of You. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Adam. Very happy to be here. I, I feel like I'm the extremely happy one because I have fallen in love with your work. And not only has it been very well articulated, as I mentioned to you earlier, it's become part of my required reading for some of my own advanced members in my series of personal trainings. It's just such incredible work. So thank you for putting this piece together and in such a clean way. I'm going to throw in directly with a question right in that. 
how'd this journey get started? Art, alchemy, the occult. How did your adventure kind of start that led it to such brilliant heights? Mm, well, started maybe a little more than 20 years ago. I'd been exploring a lot of different spiritual traditions, which led me to an interest in natural healing. And I went through a five-year study program, becoming certified in polarity therapy. And this is a hands-on modality that works with the energetic poles of the body to restore balance. And this was really my introduction to hermetics and hermetic principles and an understanding of the esoteric anatomy of the body as taught by the Vedic tradition and the Hindu tradition. And I guess that was really the beginning of it was through the body and through my own healing process and what I learned during that time and introduction to the Caduceus, the staff of Hermes, and how that relates to the energy of the body and the, the chakra system and also the elements and how those work in the body and flow through the body and understanding the connection between the within and the without, the above and the below, and how the cosmos and all of nature is reflected within us and vice versa. And through that, I, I actually went through a really difficult period in my life. And it was through my continued study of hermeticism and alchemy that I was able to kind of heal and integrate and put the pieces back together in a way that made me into a more cohesive human being. And so everything that I've written about is really grounded in this very personal experience that I had over many years. And one of the ways that I was able to integrate this was through the creative process. So that really formed the basis for all of this. And as I was going through it, I was deepening my studies with the occult and the esoteric and practicing and trying out different things within the context of creativity and painting and writing as well. That's a fascinating journey. And I think one of the most sound ones, and I say sound specific from, specifically from this idea of the body as soma, and how I feel like a lot of people sometimes coming from hurt or trauma or pain or even psychic transformations tend to turn to something like yoga as, a, as an entry point into the body that then makes them more sensitive to these components within. I'm curious, what was the first kind of linking components? I mean, if we look at hermeticism, we have, as you mentioned, the as above, so below. So there's a very deep diverse recognition of the archetypal forces, as you mentioned, the elements. What was the first kind of points that clicked in reflection to personal experience and some of the hermetic teachings? Mm, well, I would say when it really started to click is when I began to experience what the alchemists call the negredo or the black stage of alchemy, which is really the beginning of the whole unfolding of these different stages of the alchemical opus. And for me personally, it was very much the dark night of the soul and a confrontation with things deep within myself that I hadn't allowed myself to feel or to experience up until then. And when I finally did, it was life shattering and everything seemed to kind of fall apart. And this was a very real, very tangible experience. And at the time, I was just sort of beginning to explore the relationship between alchemy and creativity and opening up the unconscious through the creative process. Mm -hmm. And I came to alchemy originally through that introduction with polarity therapy and hermetics, but my first real understanding came through Carl Jung. So it was very psychological and I was just devouring books by Jung that I could get my hands on and beginning to apply these ideas of opening the prima materia, that beginning matter of the unconscious and that undifferentiated unity where everything is birthed from, opening that up through spontaneous creativity and observing what emerged and allowing that to kind of speak back to me and opening a dialogue between me and the creative process and what was coming through that helped me to see where the healing needed to happen and where the integration needed to happen. And this was several years of going through that first stage of alchemy, really, mm. really getting feel for what that's like and going through all the different parts of it where you feel like there's no way out. You feel like you're completely stuck and it's always gonna be like that. 
and then coming to the place where you start to see the light on the horizon. You start to find some hope like, oh, maybe this isn't going to last forever and maybe there is a way through this. And then the eventual continued transformation of that into something new and the birth of something new. And for me, that was really devoting myself to art as a way of life. Because before that, I'd been kind of repressing it and not really allowing this creative energy to come through in the way that it wanted to. Hmm. And instead thinking I needed to do all these other things with my time. And when I made that shift, my whole life changed for the better. And I just continued going through these different stages of alchemy and understanding them and writing about them. And yeah. So I want to I want to explore each of those components and pieces as we progress in our conversation. But I'm deeply curious. You talk about this opening of the unconscious. And that can, many people would assume that that could be a very pleasant experience or a discovering experience. But I think for many, it's quite a terrifying experience. And it is a far more real, I like to sometimes use the term that it's almost in certain ways more real than this world for the person going through that experience. For the parts that you're willing to share and participate, what was that aspect like for you when that began? And how did art come in? to act as a facilitator of the communication of that component of the self? Or was it not an, only a communicator, but maybe even a tool for the transmission and alchemy of it? Mm. Art for me was crucial to the transformation of it. When that period in my life started, it was in response to a actually a DMT trip that for me was like a near death experience, totally unexpected. And at the time I'd been feeling like just very stuck and unable to connect with some deeper part of myself. And so I kind of had this mantra and I was walking around like, I need to be broken and open. I need to be shattered. And careful what you wish I got for. what, I, yeah, I got what I wanted. And so I had this experience and confronted what literally felt like the prima materia. It mm -hmm. was, I lost all sense of self and there was no recollection of who I was or a memory of my life. And I went into this very chaotic and cold and indifferent place where there was really no differentiation between anything. It was just complete chaos. Mm. And that was my whole experience while on the DMT, which only lasts five or 10 minutes. But I came out of it and overnight, it was like my entire nervous system had been changed in mm. this way that things that used to help me self-regulate and stay calm and all of my meditative practices and <laughs> yoga, and going for long walks, all of these things just no longer worked because they would mm. induce panic because it mm. was like I had had this near-death experience and now my body knew that there was just very close to this level of reality. Mm. There was this other place, this other experience of chaos. And I felt like I could slip back into that at any point. And so anything that reminded me of that feeling of moving into another world, like we get maybe when we're meditating or receiving body work, anything like that would just immediately induce panic. Mm. And it took me a while to figure out that there are other ways to deal with this besides altered states of consciousness. And as I started painting and allowing these kind of scary things that I was confronting, because along with all of this, were all of these kind of unacknowledged parts of myself, these shadow aspects that were coming to the surface. And that was another layer of it was just this difficulty of like, wow, there's all this stuff here that I've never really looked at. And it's not really that pretty or pleasant mm -hmm. to deal with. And mm -hmm. the way that I was able to understand it and acknowledge these shadow as aspects and integrate them was through projecting them outward in the form of art. So through poetry and writing and music and allowing my dreams to kind of influence that process as well, because as the dream world is the unconscious world. And so a lot of things that we're not aware of will appear symbolically in dreams and communicate to us. And the more we pay attention to that and interact with it, the more we can learn and the deeper we can go. So that was part of the process as well. I think that's, and, um, that's gold. I mean, for the person listening, because I'm sorry to interrupt on that one. 
I feel like we always paint spirituality as the soft, pretty park. And I, I have a, a quote that I oftentimes say where I'm like, the true spirituality is not a feel good yoga retreat. It's a war and there's a real chance you won't make it. And when I refer to the you, I refer to the artificial you because that you will just not make it. It'll go through this place that goes kind of beyond the existential angst and that knowledge and that chaos, that dark sun that sits on the other side of Tifret that has to be confronted is frightening. And again, like you say, things that remind you of the experience or of any altered state creates this altered state. It's almost like it's triggered in you. And going through that is a very difficult path. And many can kind of fall. They can go into insanity or lose their minds if they try and utilize the old world's methods, the material world's structures, and they don't open themselves to the soul. And you highlight a very essential teaching there, I think, for the world is the relationship with the unconscious that behind the storm or the causes of the chaos is oftentimes the shadow fragmented component that must be articulated through the daemon within, which speaks to us so clearly through the dreams, through the feelings, through these components of the body. But now the obvious listener goes and says, but art seems like a frightening and difficult thing, expression. So my question is, what, how do we prevent the censorship? How do we explore the art? But more specifically, mm. how did whilst doing this and exploring the dreamscapes and the guidance from the inner, how did the patterns emerge within yourself? Robert Johnson in Inner Work speaks about ritualizing the dream and making it part of the participation in art. What did that look like for you in its progressive stages? Well, as far as dreams go, I've been interested in them from a very young age and started writing down my dreams when I was about 16. So, and for a long time, I didn't do any sort of interpretation other than what would kind of intuitively come to me. But at some point along the way, maybe during this period that I'm, I've been talking about, I did start doing more interpretation and allowing those dream symbols and concepts to influence the art that I was creating. And so whether I'm writing a poem or painting a picture or maybe writing a song, there's this way of kind of, I don't know, meditating upon dream symbology from the night before and allowing it just to speak for itself and to create a narrative for itself, even if it doesn't make sense, because mm. uh, a lot of times it really doesn't. And through that process, you start to connect it with things that are happening within your life and things that you've been experiencing on the daily. And uh, that's kind of how it works for me anyways. I let these dream images and circumstances and symbols merge with my daily experience mm. and that combines into a dialogue or a narrative that can then be portrayed artistically. But it's not like we have to create art for this kind of work to happen, mm -hmm. because the way I see it, we're all artists, just by the fact that we're human beings. We are creators, and we are creating our life every single day, co-creating our life. Mm -hmm. And the more consciousness we can bring to that in integration between these various levels of our being, the above and below, conscious and unconscious, the more agency we have in that creative process and the more control we have over the results that we experience. And I think in that sense, we all have this artistic ability and we can work creatively with what we have, whether that's just how we structure our day and the things that we adorn ourselves with or the foods that we decide to prepare or whatever it is that we're doing with our lives, we can be creative in the way that we do it. If, if the Buddha described all, all life as suffering and art, this then perhaps the transmutation of that suffering into beauty, into meaning, into the discovery of the, the hidden chapters between it. How then did Hermeticism come to coat this blanket and the relationship of Hermes? What was that journey like? And what is Hermes for the ongoing listener in times of the journey? Is it a man? Is it a group? Is it an archetypal figure? Enlighten us. Mm. Well, Hermes is the divine sage. And just as Hermes, he's part of the Greek tradition and thought of as, yeah, a divine sage, a teacher, and or the god Hermes, the trickster and the thief, the inventor of the lyre. But Hermes Trismegistus, or Hermes Thrice Greatest, 
is a syncretization of the Greek Hermes with the ancient Egyptian deity Thoth, mm. the ibis-headed god of wisdom, of magic, the divine scribe and the inventor of the spoken and the written word. Mm. So this combination of Thoth and the Greek Hermes uh, also includes the Roman Mercury or Mercurius. So this sort of threefold aspect of these three gods coming together and essentially all together acting as the divine mind that we all have a connection with, that we can all commune with. And Hermes and Mercury, they're also psychopomps and the guide of the souls into the underworld. And so Hermes helps us to connect these disparate parts of ourselves, to connect the above and the below, and guides us into that underworld so that we can retrieve these shadow aspects and bring them into the light and integrate them. Mm. So that's how I see Hermes. And whether or not he was an actual living figure, I can't say. To me, Hermes exists as just an integral part of the cosmos and has always been a part of that as that divine mind and that part of us that lives within us that helps us to connect with that divine and eternal part of ourselves. I love that. And, I, uh, yeah. I love where I was going to go with that was <laughs> um, as I was sort of transmuting that dark period in my life, medicism kind of came after alchemy in terms of like the roots of where alchemy comes from. And as I learned more about alchemy, I became very curious about what that tradition is rooted in. And it brought me back to ancient Egypt and a study of Egyptian mythology and understanding of the deity Thoth. And that's really where alchemy comes from and where hermeticism is rooted, is in Alexandrian Egypt and this fusion of cultures between Greece and Mesopotamia and Egypt and all of these different ideas and philosophies coming together. And Hermes Trismegistus then is the sort of patron deity of this tradition. And these sacred teachings that we read in the Corpus Hermeticum and the Emerald Tablet and these different Hermetic fragments, they're all variously attributed to Hermes Trismegistus. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, they were written by different philosophers and priests and things like that during this time, but they were channeled through this divine being kind of your own it's, i love how the correlation to that isn't your own journey i mean there's the classic hermetic idea in in the golden dawn and many other magical schools the yao formula isis apophis osiris and that mm -hmm. kind of classic transmutation of the death and the resurrection the releasing of the past self which then becomes the lord of the death or the overcoming of that which no longer serves itself, which he, we see in various transformations and journeys. The, again, the Negrito moving into the next or the progressive alchemical stages. Now, as that work within yourself progressed, there's naturally the alchemical maps. We, we explore the, the pantheons and it becomes quite evident of the common figures that show up. The four elements, the seven planets of the ancients and their endless correspondences to the chakras and all of these ideas. And you have excessive knowledge in the areas of Jungian psychology and his approach to archetypal work, which is so beautifully and richly blended in your understanding of art and alchemy. How then did your experience come in perceiving these archetypal forces, specifically those of the planets, both within yourself as well as the society as a whole. And I want to prefix that with one simple idea. I, the author's name escapes me at the moment, but he was the author of the book Technosis. And he also introduced this kind of notion of almost the hermetic renewal or the hermetic age, how that stage allowed us to the power of technique or technology, which essentially was magic that evolved in all of its various forms of expressions. And as such, almost being the articulate behind the internet and technology in and of itself. And we can see the evolution of that manifest, that mercurial manifestation of that aspect of the divine. How have you come to relate to those archetypal ideas? How do you perceive perceive them and what's your interpretation of the practice in that sense well the hermetic idea the axiom that we're all familiar with as above so below is yeah. really the essence of this archetypal idea that these archetypes they're very real and they exist within the cosmos but they're also reflected within us and vice versa and so we can connect to them through the body and we can connect to them through the mind and we can also connect to them through our observations of nature and these celestial movements that are happening in the cosmos. So these different 
art forms, sciences of astrology, magic, and alchemy are ways that we can commune with these forces of nature that are happening both within and without. And if we're looking at the body, then we're thinking about the esoteric anatomy of the body, which the Hindu tradition has presented so well, and which maps out with the caduceus of Hermes as these interweaving serpents that ascend the spinal column and the central channel of energy called Sushumna. And so these two serpents, which represent the two different poles of our being, masculine, feminine, positive, negative, active, passive, they interact and interweave and where they cross over each other along the spinal column, that's where the chakras are formed. And there's seven primary chakras and also seven planetary spheres talked about in Hermeticism and in alchemy and all in, in these Hermetic traditions. And so we can map those onto the body. And this is something that the ancients did as well, maybe not necessarily with chakras in the Hermetic tradition, but just in terms of mapping the zodiac and the planets to different organs of the body and different areas of the body mm. and corresponding them with certain illnesses and their remedies as well. And for me, when I was going through this process, I had a very deep understanding of the chakras. And so it was easy for me to kind of see how the chakras aligned with these different planetary energies. And with that Negredo phase in the beginning of the work, that's we're dealing with Saturn. And that's also mm -hmm. something that goes along with the root chakra of the body, which is located at the base of the spine and the perineum. And it has to do with everything primal and physical and our survival on the planet, our sense of groundedness and stability. And so when we're going through a traumatic period or a dark night of the soul, these things can be really shaken up and we can feel very ungrounded. And mm. if we don't have that root chakra grounded to the earth, then the rest of them are not gonna be able to find balance. And so for me, dealing with that root chakra energy was really the beginning of the journey through the seven spheres, beginning with Saturn and moving up through the chakras. And that's one way of relating to the archetypes that was very real for me because of my training in esoteric anatomy and healing. Mm -hmm. And But other ways, if we're studying astrology and looking at modern astrology, which is very psychological in its approach, we can relate these archetypes through the mind and the emotions and things that we're experiencing in our lives, both personally and collectively. And that's one way to commune with the archetypes is to, to study the cosmos, to study how, what transits are happening, study our birth chart, and to understand kind of the framework of where the planets were when we were born and how that has influenced us. To me, the hermetic take on that is not just to say, okay, this is my natal chart, the planets were here, so I am this way, but to say, this is the base level and mm. how can I transform this mm. and how can I you what I've been given and what I've come to this world with into its most ennobled expression. Mm. And magic is another way of doing that. And devotional magic, where you have a sort of practice of devotion to the planetary archetypes and connect to them in that way, that's sort of a basic level of magic. And you can take it further than that, where you're actually working with the planets with planetary timing and creating sigils and talismans and things like that to invoke their energies and create specific effects in the material world. And these are all things that I've worked with over the years in my own practice and understanding of these archetypes, different ways of connecting with them. I'm curious, looking at those planets in terms of the magical context and the exploration of the psychological components as well, if we look at approaching a planet from an inner working point of view, almost utilizing a tool like active imagination, and then combining that tool of active imagination to build a relationship with that archetypal force, which again, as within, so about, I'm not saying for many of us listening, there's purely a psychological factor, but that's the templative correspondence that opens up to something far grander. How does that relationship look for you as an artist, as a creative, between mapping that inner world unfolding and relationship with that archetypal force into your art, into your expression? Is it purely inspirational? What does that communication dialogue look like? Is it sensation? Is it feeling? It, open that up for us a little bit. Well, it happens in different ways for me. Sometimes it starts with a dream. Mm -hmm. You know, one of those big dreams that just has a lot of 
impact and feeling to it that you can't just interpret and be done with. It's like it needs a longer process of integration and understanding. And the symbols that come through aren't necessarily clear in what they're trying to tell you. So a lot of times a painting will start that way for me. Mm -hmm. And that sort of initiates a long meditation upon the symbols that were presented in the dream and reflecting that back to things that I've studied and going deeper with that and studying further and kind of beginning a meditation where I'm communing with these archetypal mm. ideas and images that have come to me through dream. And eventually things start to coagulate and I start to get an idea of what, how I might integrate them through a composition. And then I'll do a bunch of sketching to try and figure out how it all fits together and then proceed with the creative process. And it continues on with the teaching because new things will come through. And as I'm painting, new messages will kind of come through to me and information will come through. And I just keep learning until the painting is done. And even when it's done, it still keeps teaching me when I look at it and meditate on it in the future. So. That's one way, beginning with the dream that I'm trying to integrate. And sometimes active imagination comes into play where I will re-enter a dream in order to talk with different archetypes or figures that appeared in the dream and mm -hmm. ask them for more information or what it is that they're trying to communicate. And that's a really fun way to use active imagination. Another way is I'll just become interested in a certain concept or idea or planet and really feel that planetary energy wanting to be transmuted in some way for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I've done a lot of work with Venus in that regard. And also Jupiter has been really prominent in my practice. Um, yeah. And mm -hmm. life circumstances, things that are happening in relationships and with work and on the emotional level, all these things kind of factor into it. And you get an idea of like, okay, well, I'm dealing with the Venus archetype right now. And mm -hmm. clearly something is not going right with this archetype. And I'm experiencing this in all these different ways. So how can I transmute this? What, what do I need to learn here? And that begins a sort of meditation as well, where I begin communing with that planet and maybe doing like a, a devotional practice with that planet to invoke their energies or to ask for their help and restoring balance for whatever is out of balance in that area. That can be a long process as well with dreams influencing the outcome and other messages coming through nature or through other people. Like if we're always operating under the premise that our waking reality is like a dream, then everything we experience is communicating with us, everything we see. And you can take that to an extreme and kind of lose your mind with it, but yeah. just paying attention and sometimes you notice things have a certain feeling or resonance to them like synchronicities and these can kind of be communicating the direction that we need to go or yeah so I pay attention to those things and they help me kind of figure out where to go with that creative process and with understanding this archetype as it's being presented and how it wants to be transmuted and how to go about that so I want to unpack a little bit more of that if you're open to it. Yeah. There's, there was a lot of like little tidbits that I got there. And as you were expressing that, I found very interesting. Firstly, there is the deepening of the relationship as well, even into the body, being aware of kind of body based feedback beyond the dream. You give the example in terms of art, but you also earlier gave the example that your art can be something else. It doesn't necessarily have to be the painting. It could be dance. It could be many other formats in it. Have you in... I, I'm curious to see how the traditional ideas of magic may have played or integrate in that, or what of them do. I mean, do you look at the calendar to see the planetary appropriate hours? Do you pick the right colors in the candle? Is there the, the right kind of the classic occult sigils, or are they completely discarded for what comes up from your own unconscious when you're creating your work? What what is that? Let's let's start with that one. How does that magical practice look for you today? Well, in terms of just a, a basic devotional practice, which I'm pretty consistent with, and that's just on the planetary day, in the hour of the planet, if possible, doing just a very simple invocation of the planet, like reading the Orphic Hymn to that planet, huh. lighting a candle that corresponds to the color of the planet, having some stones and maybe some different totemic objects that 
I feel a planet resonates with or that that planet would like and then meditating with the planet and just letting it kind of communicate to me as it wants to. That's sort of a basic practice that I have and doesn't require any deep magic or anything too crazy. Mm -hmm. But no, I have you done lots of initiation to do that part. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, that's a very simple, beautiful way to connect with the planet. And also very effective if we're, we can have a more elaborate devotional practice with a specific planetary archetype that we need help with and that we want to invoke into our lives or that we maybe feel is deficient in our lives or something like that. But I have done more intense magical workings in a traditional sense mm -hmm. of space and banishings and all of that sort of thing. And that's, that can be really, really great and really effective. But what I prefer is the more magical creative process where I allow things to unfold in the time that they want to unfold, rather than picking an election and trying to be really specific about the timing, which is really important when you're making a talisman or something like that. But in terms of the creative process, it's not always that clean cut or idealized. And mm -hmm. when you're inspired, you're inspired. And you have to like kind of patch that wave as it's happening. And I also feel like our parents didn't make astrological elections when we were born. We just, we arrived when we did. And a painting or a work of art or a creation is kind of similar. You can time it and plan it if you want, but there's also a natural timing, which is important. Mm. And I really like to allow that to unfold in the creative process. But I don't see, I, I think it can be just as effective in terms of like talismanic magic. I've experienced that with my paintings where I want to change something within myself or a circumstance in my life. And through the painting process, I see that transform. Mm. Like when the painting is complete, that transformation has also been completed mm. or manifestation. And I yeah. think the main component is that deep communion within the soul that you're experiencing with these archetypes. And that's where that magical like invocation of that energy comes into play is through that depth of feeling and communion. Mm. And there's different ways to accomplish that. Mm. And really specific astrological timing is one way to do that, but it's not the only way. It's, I think it's because we can almost be, when following too much of the traditional magical formats, we can very much be the blind philosopher in search of nature and missing it because we get so stuck in the rules and the strategy and the left brain almost approach to it that we disconnect from the actual communion, the actual feeling component, the artistic dimension of it, which is so essential. So there's an interesting thing that that you present throughout the, the discussion and the flow. And it's something that I've, I've noted in the experience of many practitioners that have, should we say, crossed the threshold of it. And there's this point where we almost go beyond the purely rational and we move into a bhakti-like state of devotional relation with the archetypal experience. And that's where things truly become magical, where life itself at a matrix level or a fundamental level transforms from the fundamental to a magical and archetypal world. In that frame of experience, how is your relation to matter and to reality is it still dense and dead in many parts or is it is it consciousness at a fundamental level and is art the weaving instrument of your magic by which you produce reality what is your what is your translation there hmm. i love that art as the weaving instrument of my magic i do feel that way and the hermetic worldview of matter and spirit is ultimately that they are one and the same Mm -hmm. And we see them in this sort of dualistic way and we experience them that way. But in reality, everything is part of this unified field of energy. And so that's how I tend to see matter is sort of alive and vibrating and part of this field of consciousness that we're all a part of. And so everything is alive. It's mm -hmm. a very animistic way of looking at the world. But that doesn't mean that I'm constantly in a state of bliss and experiencing <laughs> I go through and I have recently just come out of kind of a dark period for myself and just sort of a period where everything needed to kind of die away a little bit for a new mm. generation to occur and I feel that right now with the emergence of 
Aries and the spring equinox and things are starting to kind of come back to life and I'm feeling a little more inspired and ready to work on projects. And that's a necessary part of the work too, is these times when we don't feel connected to things and that sense of separation. And what we learn through doing this work is that we're not really separated. We're having that experience, but the more you go through it, the less you identify with it and that it will transform mm -hmm. and that there's a purpose to it and mm -hmm. that there's a necessity to it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's... It that's opens the right goes. frame for it because I think you highlight a couple of key ideas here that I think is very important for everybody to listen to because there's it's easy to idolize, right? We think of the mystic, the author, the teacher, the, the guru, the sage that is always in the state of perfect bliss. And one of my old spiritual teachers used to say that holiness is boring. This this hallucination of that eternal state is potential, but if you're there, you're not really going to be in media. You're not really going to have a lot of interest in the world or working at the world because you're going to be too separated from these variances of the nature of duality. And to recognize that one of the key progression points is maybe the further we get on the path, the better we get. Like a martial artist that becomes more articulate in their flow of the, the trauma of turning the chaos into art, so to speak. But it does not suddenly extract the chaos. It's just the way in which it's related to is at a deeper level or at a different level. We can now make love to paint at a far more intense and meaningful level than we could at the earlier stages. Like at the earlier stages, they were a bit rougher. So inside of that kind of progression line, I want to kind of ask, because there's another question that opened up in this, but I want to backtrack a little bit to an earlier part of our conversation. We were talking about structures of magic and the ceremonial components versus these intuitive components. Now, many can step into the world of the occult and go, several magic and occult orders, many years of initiatory lines in different orders and schools. What is your fundamental view just on that technical component? Self-initiation versus order to initiation, structured ceremonial magic and training in those systems, long esoteric hermetic studies versus the intuitive self-graduated progression. And what's been your experience in that? Well, I'm a big proponent of self-initiation, mm -hmm. uh, but I know that that's not always practical for people or manageable for people because it's helpful to have someone kind of guiding you along and encouraging you. So I totally understand when people prefer to have a sort of organized initiation through some sort of order. Mm -hmm. And I've thought about it and I tend to think of myself as self-initiated, but I did have this five-year period where I was learning polarity therapy. And that was very much like an initiation into understanding basic hermetic principles and Ayurvedic healing and esoteric anatomy and all of that. And so in a way, I did sort of have an ordered initiation in that sense. And other than that, though, I've had many people that have served as teachers in my life in a less organized way. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when you are on the self-initiated path, teachers will present themselves at the right time. Mm -hmm. And it does take a certain level of dedication and commitment and the sort of willingness to push yourself deeper into these fields of study and practice and experiential gnosis, ultimately. But the thing that an ordered initiation is very structured and it can be helpful for a certain type of person, but we can, I think, be misled if we think that someone else can tell us when mm. we're initiate. Yes, yes. I, I think that's that. a very, very personal experience. And mm. I don't think it's something that you just, you get to a certain level and you're done. It's yeah. yes. continuous. Yes. Yeah. Not necessarily linear either. Mm. Very, very true. Especially when it comes to the unlocking of the planetary dimensions within the self. I mean, it's, it's very easy for us to paint this in a perfect portrait upon the tree of life and say this stage follows that stage, but experience tends to be a little bit different as well as mm -hmm. astrological position, personal challenges that we are overcoming. So opening that Pandora's box a little bit more, um, what is Gnosis for you in your experience? For me, in my experience, Gnosis is the ultimate self-knowledge that we can have that connects us with that unified source of all things mm. and an experience of our immortality, of our eternal essence and what we truly are beneath all of the layers 
that we experience as the self. And like, because that's, I want you to unpack that I've, more self, unpack it, keep going. This is something that I've glimpsed mm -hmm. and in pretty profound ways. And it's something that I return to and experience in new ways all of the time. But I don't think, again, I don't think there's, you realize Gnosis and then you're done and you've like completed the work. It's, a, it's an unfolding. But once we have had that sort of deeper experience of the real self beneath all these layers of this external self and the ego and the personality and these things that we've built up over time and all of the conditioning that goes along with that, and you get to the essence of essentially the realization that we are the creator, that stays with you to a certain degree. You might forget it a little bit, but it stays with you and it helps you along the way. Mm. And like you were saying, these processes, we don't stop going through them and we don't stop having to deal with the chaos. It's always there. But Gnosis is this deeper wisdom that helps us to navigate that. And mm. that is constantly reminding us that we're not alone and that we are essentially immortal in our soul and that we are part of this ever-evolving eternal cosmos and that all of that everything that's happening externally to us is actually happening within us and it's Very beautiful it would be easy to also mistake this for a sort of megalomania or like i am god i am the creator but there's a humility to it as well mm. I, I, for, I forget the author that said it, and it's one of my favorite quotes, and I should really check the author. But he, he, he said he titled the third term that we are gods with anuses. <laughs> it's a kind of a returning to our humility of recognizing that a spark of ourselves is divine, is truly the lead, but another portion of ourselves, or as part of the gold, and another portion is still the lead. And it's an ongoing alchemical journey that is never ending because the divine is never ending. A year, a year, a year was I will be that which I will be, not I am that which I am. It's the eternal unfolding and the endless expression. It's one of my my big reasons for being such a, a speaker on the subject of technomancy and technosis, the idea that the infinite mathematical structures of the universe that underlines dimension and position produces almost the endless angles or angels of art, these different perspectives that are infinite in their progression. So to assume that there's an ending or a goal or a subject is just the keter of the one tree is the malkuf of the next tree, right? That eternal progressive journey that we go on to in this expanse of knowledge attained and personal experience attained and your own arsenal of magical gifts, shall we say, or instruments, the paintbrush to the musical instrument, to dance, to song, to poetry, to writing, to all of these instruments. When coming down the mountain of experience, when on the return home on the second portion of the journey, back up down from that space, how do you catch yourself when the self is so deep in the light? that it doesn't want to reflect on a darkness that it sees slowly emerging in the world. How do you recognize mm. that? And then how do you go to work on that part? Mm, that's a great question. I mean, I think, I think it's easy to want to stay on the mountain and mm. to want to stay in that area of light. But if we're really, if we're really doing the work and we're really in a conscious place, that's not possible. The world was always there. We're always going to have to come back down to the world and integrate these higher spiritual ideas on the mundane level. But I think what you realize is that nothing really is mundane. And the shadow aspects, these things that are creeping up from below and asking to be seen and acknowledged and integrated, they are part of the light as well. They yeah. already are. Mm -hmm. And they're just ways of helping us to explore all the different sides of that light, which the shadow is just another side of that. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting question. For me, it just, it feels like the world and these deeper parts of the self, they're always calling. And I can't ignore them. I'm a very deeply feeling person. And so I have to acknowledge them as they arise. And that's a pretty regular occurrence. In that occurrence, because this is just something I'm kind of picking up in your sense and your communication, I, I experience, imagine there's a very strong kinetic relationship to your magic and your experiences as that comes through. Mm -hmm. How difficult is it to articulate that into voice 
or into experience or into art when it comes through. And for somebody that is maybe new to that, because one of the things that I found when working with most people is that the first stage is not necessarily teaching them more profound occult ideas. It's sometimes just getting them to shut up and feel in, to open up the being in terms of those experiences. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a little bit of an artist toolkit, what could you share with somebody that's listening that's saying that I'm feeling these different components of the self that's seeking expression. I may be a little bit lost in the literature and the map of what I'm going to do. I'm definitely picking up a copy of this because trust me, everyone, when I say that this is such a genius, well-articulated piece of work for years of different collections and strategies. If you haven't gotten your hands on this, make sure you get a link now at the bottom and you buy one. And I'm not just pimping this because we're in the conversation, but because it really is an incredible piece of work. But for somebody that's now kind of in the maze of the ideas and the concepts and these palaces of genius, which is really what the hermetic structure is. It's the palace of genius and the divine mind of Mercury in and of itself. How do I find my way inside of that storm and that realm of perfection mm -hmm. when the shadow comes creeping into the garden and says, speak to me, because if you do not, the storm will come upon you. Mm -hmm. What do I say to it? How do I speak to it? How do I build that relationship and that dynamic in a way that heals and guides? Yeah, first of all, I mean, just creating the right space for that part of ourselves to express itself is really crucial. If we're constantly overstimulated with social media and news and work and obligations and all of these things that are pulling on our attention and our energy, that part of ourselves may not want to communicate with us because there's no space for it. Mm. Whether that's a shadow aspect or whether that's a divine aspect that wants to teach us something. So the first thing is creating that space and that can be facilitated through having a regular meditation practice and just learning to still the mind and focus the mind and to be able to sit in silence and mm. not, not lose it. And that can take a lot of work and practice, especially yeah. if we're not used to it. So that's just a very fundamental part of it is creating the space. And we all have obligations and responsibilities and things we have to do. But the more we can kind of tune into that silence within us and create space, even amidst all of the busyness of our lives, taking a few breaths in between things, taking just even just five breaths and allowing the thoughts to kind of dissipate during those five breaths. That can just be immensely helpful in allowing these deeper messages to come through. And then when they do start coming through, it's important that we we acknowledge them and we let them know that we're listening. And so there's different ways we can do that. We can write in a journal and write down the things that are coming through, whether that's a, a synchronicity that we experienced or a set of synchronicities or maybe an important dream or a certain feeling that just pervades our day. Or maybe there's a certain animal archetype that is presenting itself to us in multiple ways. Maybe we see the symbol of an eagle on a, you know, a truck passing us on the highway and then we see an eagle in the sky and then later on someone talks about an eagle. And so then we have three presentations of this archetype. And so obviously that eagle is wanting to teach us something. So we can say, well, what does the eagle mean to me? What do I feel about the eagle? And get in touch with our own direct personal associations as a starting point. And if we need some more help, we can look at books on symbology or do some research on the internet, but carefully make sure you, yeah, tune into what feels right for you and also look at legitimate sources and stuff like that. And so in that way, we can start to receive through creating that space, receive these messages from the unconscious, which is not just communicating to us through dreams or through the body, but through all of nature, you know, connected to everything. And so if we're looking at reality as though it were a dream, it's a field of the unconscious that's speaking back to us. And it's not always easy to tease out where those messages are coming through. We need to pay attention. So I would say that's sort of a beginning point and these messages will guide you in the right direction. They will show you the next step if you're listening and you're interacting with them. I love that. I think 
Um, I always describe the unconscious as the personal God, like the God with the small g that connects us to the greater God at a deeper level. But the thing to recognize is this God is a lot like a Harparkrut, the God of silence in many ways, and deep reflection is the inner child. And if you go to the inner child and you say, or even to a normal child, and you're expecting a certain response, it may not always tell you the truth because it's responding to your expectation of it. And to give up that expectation and to allow is sometimes a deeper challenge for many. You've given us a very beautiful entry point, I think, for many that are sincere seekers into hermetics. And your book becomes such a nice pillar for somebody, especially starting, that doesn't want to take that massive, massive 20-year journey of really exploring and finding all those things at first to really get a good articulation of everything, especially the planets. And again, I praise you way too much in this one, but I'm going to keep doing it. The way that you've articulated the planets and the stages and those degrees there is just incredible work. It's pretty much half of the book in that sense. So it's very detailed. It's very well put together. Where does this lead us? You have another book coming out very soon, July, I believe. And yep. that's that culminates the journey. Give us a little bit of a teaser. Give us a slide. Where are we going on this adventure with you? Well, the first book is really the foundation. So that gets into the history of Hermeticism and the cosmological ordering of the Hermetic worldview and the seven planetary spheres and how those present archetypally. And the second book opens the world and the great work of alchemy. And so it begins with a sort of historical journey through four different art periods through the 19th and early 20th centuries. So from romanticism through surrealism and how the occult and alchemy has played into those art movements mm -hmm. and influenced them and how different artists during those periods employed alchemical concepts in their work and hermetic concepts. And that sort of lays the foundation for going through the four stages of the magnum opus, the great work of alchemy. So from that beginning stage of the Negredo that I mentioned previously, through the final stage of the Rubedo, and mm -hmm. how someone can work with those both creatively and spiritually to unlock their own full authentic creative potential, whether that's through art or just through living an inspired and creative life. Hmm. And maybe come to the point where we resolve the dualities within us in their varied forms. Yes, yes. And Mercury, Hermes being the, the guide in that process and that unifying agent of the soul and the spirit or soul and Luna, the sun and the moon. Well, I look forward to that piece and I hope I get to invite you back to the show and we can speak through those periods and I'd love to hear the concepts of art. I'll share some ideas of the technological developments in those times and we can balance left and right brains um, <laughs> through a very interesting discussion if you'd be open for the idea. Oh yeah, that sounds fantastic. Let's do it. Deal, yeah. deal. Everybody, you heard it. You heard it here. That was that was an agreement from seven. <laughs> so we're going to make sure as soon as that piece is out that we can get it on the show and everyone can get a good view on it. And I promise to be detailed, but I promise to save the best for the interview. Uh, so David, it's been an absolute honor and a privilege sharing this conversation with you. Before we close, I'd like to experiment with an idea. I have a, a, a little bit of a catchphrase for me, which is uh, remember to live deliciously. And it was, it came to me very much, not purely in a sensual dynamic, but at a point in my life where I started to recognize that true ecstasy was not for me to be found in another person or a place or an experience. It was to find those components of mine that have been shattered through people, places, times, and to again pour into myself the ecstasy that is inherent. What's your secret for living deliciously? Mm. Well, for me, I think about the hermetic idea of the eighth sphere. So we've mm -hmm. got the seven planetary spheres, these archetypes that work through us both consciously and unconsciously. But the eighth sphere is outside of those seven spheres and sort of encompasses all of them. And I relate it to the state of being in creative flow. So we're not being hold to one polarity or the other, to one side of our being or the other, the rational or the irrational. We're not opposed to ourselves, battling ourselves from within. We've united these opposites. They're working together in a unified way. 
And so there's this continual ebb and flow between the polarities and that still point between them and kind of understanding when to ebb and when to flow, when to act and when to rest, when to move and when to be still. And that is that state of flow is just being in that moment and having all of these planetary archetypal energies working through us and for us in support of that flow. And to me, that is the most delicious place to be. And when I can get there, it's, yeah, it is bliss. It sounds like a true glass of Amari, uh, what Amarita or Amara? How's the how's the, yes, the alchemical? Amrita. There we go. The alchemical drink, right? <laughs> Absolutely delicious. I love it. <laughs> Jevin, thank you so much for gracing the show with your presence and your brilliant ideas. I've definitely had an incredible time listening to you unpacking your concepts. And again, for everybody listening, make sure you get a copy. And I look forward to having you back on the show with us. I very much look forward to that. It's been such a pleasure and an honor to speak with you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. I've always felt a little different. A little uneasy between regular folk. A bit of a dreamer, a lost cause. A little non-ordinary, some would say. I think I've always just been this way. My mother said I was special. My father thought I should be feared. But I knew that witchcraft coursed through my veins the first time I tasted the lips of the goddess inside the rain. Yes, I'm a witch, it's true. And sure, we are the ones who believe in the beauty of nature, who believe in the things science, absent of art, cannot explain. Who instead of religion would have romance. And sure, you may think we have lost our way, when in the world of predictable things we have such unfamiliar things that we would like to say. But maybe, in a world so cold and alone, a little unfamiliar is exactly what is needed to show us the way home.